Thanks everybody uh, for joining us for our third session this morning um, with SCAPE Landscape Architecture DP Principal Pippa Brashear. She is a leading expert on resilience and climate adaptation and works with large multidisciplinary teams to develop landscape strategies and next century infrastructure that integrate environmental, economic, and social benefit. Pippa currently manages SCAPE's role on the financial district and support resilience project in lower Manhattan for the New York City Economic Development Corporation, Climate Ready Dorchester, a neighborhood scale resilience plan for the city of Boston, and the design and implementation phase of living breakwaters for the New York State Governor's Office with storm recovery, among other projects. Pippa holds a master in landscape architecture and a master in planning with a dis with distinction from Harvard University Graduate School of Design and a BA um, in environmental science and public policy from Harvard. Please join me in welcoming Pippa. Thank you. Um, can I, everybody hear me? All right. I'm going to try to. Uh, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about designing resilience. Um, I'm going to talk about some projects, but I really want to use them to highlight how I and my colleagues at SCAPE think about trying to tackle this issue of designing for climate change and for resilience. And I'm going to try to define that term in terms of how we think about it. So a little briefly about who we are um, is um, SCAPE is a landscape architecture firm, but we're really interdisciplinary. We are comprised of architects, urban designers, urban planners, horticulturalists. So we really take a are grounded in the landscape and a landscape perspective, but do a fair bit of planning um, work at various scales. Um, we are based in New York City, um, but we also have an office. Um, we're based in New York City and New Orleans. Um, and so uh, the New Orleans office opened a few years ago, um, and that was really because of the work in the region. And I think the experiences over the past decade plus um, with coastal risk and coastal storms in New York and New Orleans have really influenced um, us professionally and personally in many ways. So I'm gonna talk a lot about our climate resilience planning work, but we um, we are a, a diverse landscape practice and work on everything from small scale urban plazas uh, to large regional master plans. Um, and you know, I, I put this up because a lot of our projects, we really think about resilience in all of our work and um, you know, it doesn't matter if we're designing a plaza or we're doing a project that is specifically about coastal flood adaptation. The climate is changing, and that is something that we have to think about as designers um, everywhere. Um, I, this is a monograph that was uh, published by our founder, Kate Orff, a few years back. And I think, you know, it, it really sums up our attitude and philosophy towards design in the landscape, which is that we aim to create positive change in communities by creating, combining regenerative living infrastructure and new forms of public space. So really, you know, spaces for an ecosystem that include people, um, but really accept the world around us as a dynamic place. Um, and so some strategies that we'll use, and you'll see in what I talk about today, are really trying to connect to and revive landscape systems, to forge connections between people and their natural environment, to generate ecosystems with our work, not just protect them, but actually create spaces for ecosystems, be they be it conservation or creating novel spaces as we create places that need to change the environment. We embrace physical reality. We're not really interested in plans that cannot be realized or visions that don't make sense in the space and place they are created. So we engage very specifically with our environment. Um, and we experiment. We think pilot projects and testing techniques and ideas are very important. Um, and we really work to engage people in all of our work. Um, we are designing places for people, but also engaging people in the process of design. And, the, and I think that's really important in resilient design, as you'll see. So um, I just pulled, you know, we've done, I'm going to talk about a few projects, but we've done a lot of work around resilience. Um, you know, here in New York City, where I live, I live in Brooklyn, um, in the wake of Superstorm Sandy. But you know, this term of re resilience and resilient design um, comes up again and again. And, and um, 
this is something that's kind of and been happening more and more. So these projects that we're working on are growing and more and more towns, cities, places are really interested and concerned about resilience, particularly coastal resilience um, with our changing climate. And so what does that mean? I like this definition um, because it speaks to this idea that, to, that not only survive, but adapt to thrive and transform. That resilience is not just coming back to something that is today or yesterday, but really uh, it involves a dynamism. And it is really about bouncing forward, as some people say, into what you want to be. And that may be maintaining the status quo in some places, but that may also be striving towards your future. So we shouldn't um, just be thinking about protecting what we have, but creating um, what we need and what we want for ourselves and our children. So I'm gonna talk about just some themes that I think have resonated when we're really trying to design for resilience and particularly coastal resilience. Um, it is about risk, right? The climate is changing and there are lots of climate threats. And it's really important to actually sort of understand and think about those. And we see a lot of maps like this. What's gonna happen with sea level rise? This is a project that we're working on um, for, resilient, for adapting to rising sea levels in lower Manhattan with um, Arcadis Engineering and one uh, architecture. And I'll mention a lot of the partners that we work with on these projects throughout this because um, it's a really, you know, this is a very collaborative space and this is going to take many hands and many minds to come up with constructed adaptation solutions. Um, and so you look at a lot of these maps, but it's important to communicate to each other and to people around you what this means. This means if you're standing on the bulkhead in lower Manhattan in 2100 with the sea level rise projections that New York City, conservative sea level rise projections that the city expects, you know, your kid could be underwater. And if you're talking about storm surge, you know, Sandy was was rough and it was it is it created intense damage and disruption in lower Manhattan. But if that storm happened, in 10, in 20 years and 50 years, it's only going to be worse. Um, and so we've also tried to, um, and at the end of the presentation, I put this link on here as you can go, but we've also tried to put people in the space and use different tools to help understand risk. Because I think it's really important um, for people to see and feel that. Um, but the other thing, and I think this really resonates with a lot of the work um, that we've done, but is particular to, to um, Nantucket as well, is it's not just about rising water levels. You know, it's not this storm surge and trying to figure out how to elevate a home or put a wall to keep the water out. The ocean um, and the coasts are really dynamic spaces, right? Tides fluctuate every day. There are waves and rising, Still, still water surge alone does not do this. It damages homes, but it's waves that knock homes off their foundation. So you really need to understand if the space that you're working in is a place that is at risk just from surge or from waves. And waves also do this. Even small waves gradually over time start to erode our beaches. And erosion is a normal dynamic process. Right. The beach is a dynamic place. And this is something that we have to think about as we live and settle there. But as we've hardened a lot of our shorelines and developed along it, we are in many ways exacerbating that erosion. And this is um, I'll talk a little bit more about the project that came out of this. But this is the south shore of Staten Island. This is New York City. And I think people recognize lower Manhattan. But this is also New York City. And this shoreline, you know, people have lived here. This is city parkland at the southern tip of the island, but gradually over time, it is losing shore, acres and acres you know, of beach that puts these homes at risk, um, but also it takes away important um, coastal land from use. Um, and the construction of structures over time have changed that pattern and potentially exacerbated that risk. So, you know, I think what I wanna highlight is we can't, it's never, especially when we're talking about coastal risk, it's never that simple, right? The, the coasts, the waters are really dynamic places. Our climate is dynamic. So even if we are talking about, um, oops, 
Oh, my video is not working. Even if we're talking about temperature and heat, I haven't even gotten there. There's so many things that we could talk about. The one thing that we have to understand is uncertainty, that um, dynamism um, is going to happen over the course of a day, over the course of our time, and we're not going to be able to predict it with certainty. So as we start working in this realm of climate change adaptation and resilience, we have to have that flexibility and accept that. But I think as important as really understanding and, and in, encompassing risk in our thinking is, it's really important to remember that resilience is not just risk reduction, um, right? In the wake of Sandy, suddenly in New York, there was a great fear of the water. Um, there was a huge focus on the damage that happened and the damage that water can do. And there were a lot of maps like this, lots of red. Um, you know, there were lives lost. There was huge economic cost. Um, and there were a lot of proposals to build big walls everywhere. But the reality is if the water is also the lifeblood of New York and the lifeblood of many communities like Nantucket, they, uh, it is sort of culturally and economically defined what it is. If not for New York Harbor, then not New York City. And so we also were thinking these are these water-based communities, water-based economies, and that we need to think about how we adapt in light of that. So when we had the opportunity to participate in a competition that was host that was sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation, along with the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development called Rebuild by Design, we really tried to think in, in that line. And the project that we developed through that competition was called Living Breakwaters. And what it did is try to combine risk reduction, ecology, and culture that says, yes, we need to reduce risk. We need to do it in a way that sustains and invigorates and continues to make our coastal communities a great place to be and enhances the ecology of the harbor. So these breakwaters, offshore structures designed to reduce those damaging storm waves, to knock them down as they approach the shore, to by interacting with everyday waves, start to capture settlement and build back beach, but also start to create habitat, niches and crevices for different organisms and fish to inhabit and really create aquatic environment. And also begin to cultivate a culture of stewardship. Um, the, the, the restoration associated with the breakwaters, and I'll talk a little bit about different communication, was really aimed at engaging particularly our next generation of stewards within um, Staten Island and the city uh, to engage in issues of climate and um, conservation arbor-wide. So, um, you know, one thing, you know, how do we start thinking about how we do this and how we combine these things? And one is to really look and dig deep into the places you are and be inspired by nature and history. And that was something that was really at the heart of the Living Breakwaters project. By sort of building back the beach, we really, you know, we, this is a historic photograph of that beach um, from, the early, from earlier in the century. And people, uh, you know, it was this vibrant place and we felt that um, it, while it's now a lot largely residential, that it, but is still a public park, building back um, the beach will really help enhance and improve that access. But the other thing is, this is a historic um, oyster ground. Um, historically, in the pre-1800s, pre-European settlement, there were rich oyster beds. Um, and if people don't know the history of oysters in New York City, um, it was not only um, sort of an ecosystem, but became quite an industry such that, you know, by the mid-1800s, you had these massively farmed beds. And in fact, um, the, the neighborhood that is adjacent to this project, Cottonville, there's a history book about it that says Cottonville, the town the oyster built. Um, the picture here is of workers um, from Sandy Ground, which was one of the first uh, communities of free um, slaves that resettled in New York and brought their knowledge from the Chesapeake Bay um, to create a very successful oyster farming industry in Staten Island. Um, but with dredging and pollution, that, that industry was really depleted. And so now there's talk of restoration, how we restore. So one of the things that we really focused on was how can these structures be a place to start to restore oysters but not so much just to put oysters back, but to create the ecosystem function that they put that they put here. We know that the living breakwaters are not oyster reefs, but how can they begin to create the habitat 
um, and provide the ecosystem services to support and enhance this amazing, um, diverse aquatic uh, ecosystem of the Bay. And so we really started to understand the typologies of, um, of habitat structures and the target species that would use them. Um, and worked with our, you know, and envisioned this idea of, um, of reef streets that really came from an understanding and observation of how reefs were structured in nature. Um, and worked with our um, ecologists on our team to think about how to really craft and create that complexity at the macro scale, but also at the surface scale. So we were also looking at like individual materials that would be used in the breakwaters ultimately coming up a with a design that um, through analysis and design that would really mimic that environment and we thought would create habitat um, that will someday create this. So I'm, I talked a little about like where we get and find inspiration um, for resilience, but it's really important to inspire others. Um, climate adaptation is going to take a long time and building infrastructural projects does too. Um, these are some supporters that helped us develop um, materials and models as part of the Living Breakwaters project. And what was really exciting about that project is people during the competition phase is people got really engaged. Um, this is someone who took it upon themselves, was very inspired by the oyster component um, of this as we were and made this amazing hat and was handing out flyers at the ferry terminal um, to come you know, to the public meeting about the project. Um, and there were a lot of people who wrote letters in support of the project. And so while I like to think that um, the design itself was inspirational, I think it was the energy that it inspired among a lot of constituents that helped uh, make it one of the winning designs. And so the state of New York, the governor's office of storm recovery received $60 million to implement the project. Um, and that was back in 2013. Um, but we have been working on it um, since then and keeping that inspiration alive has been really important. Um, as I mentioned, sort of how it can cultivate the next generation of stewards is really important. We've been working closely with our project partner, the Billion Oyster Project, as well as the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery to support ongoing uh, communication about the project in schools. And we've actually worked with the Billion Oyster Project to develop a STEM curriculum module that teachers can use um, to use the project and the project design to teach about things like waves and coastal uh, and climate change um, and history, um, even boat design. So um, it's really interesting and exciting. Um, and gone to other events and tabled really to introduce um, uh, people, especially children, um, to the ecosystems of the harbor, um, as well as uh, sort of just provided really easy to access and visible updates on the project to residents, because um, this is in the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. Um, and for anyone who is interested, um, we also uh, were invited to put together an exhibition for the New York Historical Society, um, which has now been made into a virtual um, exhibit. So you, you can go and see this exhibit that was there. It's called Hudson Rising. Um, but, you know, it's important to inspire, but you have your ideas still have to work. We want to get this, get these things built, constructed, um, make them happen, and make sure that they actually address the risks and create the resilient opportunities that we've talked about. So, you know, we said the breakwaters attenuate waves, the breakwaters will build back beaches, but how do we know that that has happened? We've really done rigorous testing and analysis that's most, that's combined a lot of numerical computer modeling, but also physical modeling that you see on the left. Um, oops, wrong way. So this is just a quick summary, like how, it's, there's not one model. Um, it was really good that Elise, you know, talked before this, because I think we work with a lot of partners. Um, Arcadis Engineering did the modeling for this project, but we work very, we've worked very closely with Elise's firm, Woods Hole Group, in doing this, and it's really important. Um, to really understand that risk is not singular and you need to figure out all these questions. And so we did modeling to look at, at shoreline change and how the breakwaters would affect that shoreline change, but not just once, um, a lot. Um, 19 different scenarios is fact by 60% design. I think we're on like 25 before we finished. So um, there were a lot of testing. 
Um, and then looking at models that helped us understand during those storm conditions the degree to which waves were attenuated. Red are bigger waves, blue being smaller waves. Um, and understanding that because these models are complex and take time to run, how to use increasingly complex models so that you can model more uh, scenarios quickly early on and then later on start to use more complex models to really refine the design. Um, like I said, we also actually built um, structural models when we're talking about coastal environment and coastal engineering, really understanding how they hold up in these dynamic environments um, takes often still physical moderate. Um, but I also, it's not just the risk aspect. We're also thinking about the materials and the ecological aspect and do they work? So again, partnering with the Billion Oyster Project, these disks that you see are pieces that would go into um, the breakwaters to create some of that. Um, they're bioenhancing concrete. So the content of them is made to promote bioaccumulation, but also the structure has uh, a lot of surface area and complex surface area. Um, to get things to grow on. Um, and on the right, you see me and someone sticking them into the, a lagoon just uh, up the shore from where the project area. And the bottom two images is one season of oyster growth on these. So they were preceded with oysters that put in the water. We had a lot of people saying like, oh, oysters don't grow in the waters around here anymore. And so we tested these materials and in fact they do. Um, and it was that type of rigorous testing ideas that you know got us to the type of drawings that we now have which are construction documents. Um, this project is going into construction next year. Um, so it is a big idea. It took a long time to come to, and we need to just sustain that energy, um, but it takes really understanding you know, how it works. And in case you're like, oh my gosh, but that's a huge project. We can't test things. You can test things. You can do quick pilots. This was a small pilot project at, um, uh, recycling pier that we did prior to the project when we were just trying to test materials. The technical term for this net is fuzzy rope. Um, and similarly, we were looking at how organism growth could happen on different materials and how we can do that. And so this has been out there. We've tested it, pulled it up, seen what's grow, and it's informed um, some of our own in-water design in the future. Um, Similarly, for another project, Public Sediment, out on the West Coast that we did, this is at SUNY ES, ESF in upstate New York, testing um, the impact of different interventions in riverine environments. So there's ways to set up and test, and I think it's just really important in the design process to find that, particularly in resilience, because we're not dealing with situations we know. We're dealing with changing situations. Um, and so, you know, I've talked a lot about the physical, I've talked about the ecological, but in the end, resilience is about people and places. Um, so it's not, you know, I think one of the things we talk, people got caught up in thinking about risk reduction and coastal protection, and you start seeing bigger walls and bigger levees. But if you, um, whether it's a public space that you go to, or whether it's your home, if you live near the shore, you live near the shore because you feel a deep connection um, to the water. And so finding strategies that allow that to happen is really important. And I just want to use this example um, from Pensacola, um, Florida, um, that we worked on with the city there as sort of an example to illustrate this. Um, we developed a, a waterfront. We work with them to develop a waterfront framework plan. And this was really more about um, invigorating the downtown, the downtown waterfront. They had sort of these sort of robust downtown quarters that um, weren't really feeling like they were, um, that the, the, the downtown waterfront was uh, the type of space that they, they wanted it to be and felt like it could do more and support this, the sort of economic vibrancy of the city more. Um, as part of that, um, there was a large vision um, but we identify what we called catalytic projects. So what are the projects that would really sort of tip the balance um, that you would do first, but also products that projects that would catalyze other projects? And I think this is really important to think about in resilience because many of the things that we're talking about are things that are gonna take a very long time to do and to build. And so um, how, do we, how do we sort of make one project inform and make the next more likely to happen? And I wanna focus on this one, um, Bruce Beach here. So if you know Pensacola um, in Florida, people come to Pensacola to go to the beach. And 
while you see the pin on downtown Pensacola, people are going to these beaches, these vast barrier islands with these white sand beaches. And the reality is that Pensacola doesn't, the city doesn't really have the beach. This is Bruce Beach. This is the beach that's actually in the city. Um, and so how can we bring some of that to the city and connect it to that larger environment is one of the questions. Um, there are existing wetlands um, that are part of a, 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 um, a project that was uh, part of a mitigation. Um, and you can see the barrier island beaches in the distance. Um, but the other thing we're I'm stand, this picture is taken from on the top of a, a mound of um, construction debris that unclear what they were exactly, but may have been from the demolition of this pool. Um, this site is adjacent to historically African-American neighborhood um, in Pensacola. And this site, it has since been demolished, was the location of um, the only pool that was open um, to African-Americans during segregation. And so there's a really, there's a strong cultural history here too, um, that speaks to creating equitable um, public spaces and maybe rethinking some of our, our past history of public spaces. There. So um, as part of this project, we did workshops um, with the community, tried to uh, help people envision what this space could be and talk about the opportunities. And so I think this goes back to some of the things I said at Living Breakwaters is you have to know where you want to go to understand you know, how you want to adapt to it. Um, so these projects, this process identified a set of key priorities of connecting people to the water, um, creating and creating this cultural and educational um, destination. So resilience for a place to be, it also needs to resonate culturally and be culturally, be economically resilient. If it's not feasible, if it's not a place that people want to be or can be, um, then, then what, what are we adapting to or protecting against? Um, and so this is the existing Bruce speech. And this was the, the re-envisioning of that, um, that again, you know, had this aspect of, of physical resilience and connecting um, these water bodies preserving existing marsh and building and stepping back up, but also really incorporated all of these destinations to make sure that it was culturally sustainable, that it was a place that was going to resonate and be there and help the, the city be uh, resilient into the future. Um, it was, the aim was also to uh, make this ecologically resilient um, and really took and drew from ecosystems um, of the region uh, to connect between the, the upland and coast. Um, and, you know, similarly, this is sort of that view, again, looking out from that beach. So again, crafting this as a place that people could be um, and resonate with. And why? Is this so? One of the things, as um, you know, we talk about adaptation. Economic is resilience is something that we have to think about too, because we really are entering into a phase where um, you know, we have aging infrastructure, and yeah, you know, I like to say the era of single-purpose infrastructure is over. And many of the reasons that we really try to combine um, conservation and ecological resilience with access and physical resilience is we can't afford to do individual infrastructure in silos. We need to actually um, figure out how to be efficient with our money and, and be able to fund and pay for these things. And so, you know, the, the economic consultants on this team, and this is different in different places, but one of the things was bolstering the tax revenue in downtown um, for Pensacola. And um, there was a now that, you know, there is there are studies from the uh, Urban Land Institute, amongst others, that really speak to the role of um, of quality public spaces in attracting um, that that creative economy. And um, you know, whoop, sorry, and the the ways that parks and open space can catalyze that. And so, for this community, this was really an avenue. Um, for making an economically resilient as well as physically and culturally resilient. Um, so that's like, that is a different 
um, perspective on resilience, but I, I think it helps highlight how holistic um, we want to be and think. Um, and I just want to end with um, a, an example of um, something a little closer to Nantucket um, in Boston to highlight the fact that you've got to that to sort of re re highlight this fact of you have to have this idea of a vision of where you want to be. Um, and a city I think that has been doing a really good job of of doing this at a citywide scale is Boston. Um, it's very hard to to organize people around a shared um, vision of the city, but um, it's also hard to organize people around climate adaptation, as I'm sure everyone here um, has experienced. And so uh, in 2016, uh, Boston initiated, uh, published their Climate Ready Boston Plan, um, which was a very robust analysis of Boston's climate risks, particularly coastal risks, um, but also a framework for how the city would adapt. Um, and they focused on neighborhoods and started to undertake a series of neighborhood plans. And these neighborhood plans did a, an excellent job of really identifying what, um, what the coastal risks were, starting to craft strategies that they could adapt. Um, but by going one by one, one of the things, um, and these are some of the neighborhood plans that are, are in progress and um, was one of the things that um, folks at the city realized was they hadn't talked about how they all tied back together. And one of the conversations um, that still needed to be had was, what is the Boston of the future? What is the resilient, what became the resilient Boston Harbor vision? And so we worked with the city to synthesize not just that risk, but the visions that were coming out of the individual and neighborhood plans into a citywide vision that began to talk, speak to how um, flood protection, the city has taken a very strong stance to kind of keep water out and close off critical flood pathways. Um, could be combined with um, water waterfront access priorities, places like the Harbor Walk in the city, and other, um, you know, and the economic vitality of the city as a whole um, into a larger vision. And so this looked at the whole harbor, but also, um, you know, what this starts to feel and look like, but also individual neighborhoods. This is looking into East Boston from the north and sort of how this yellow representing the sort of line of protection and coastal protection would overlay with um, transit connections, other connections that were mapped out in many of the city's other visions, visions for racial equity, visions for transportation connectivity, like Go Boston um, and the Boston 2030 vision plan. And even started to dive into and imagine what how individual spaces um, plugged in. And so what this helped to do was create a unifying and synthesizing framework around the different neighborhood plans that the, the mayor could speak to, um, that people could get behind and say, we are thinking about this as a citywide, as a citywide thing. And so um, at, following on that, we worked with the city on one of those neighborhood um, plans for Dorchester, one of the, the city's largest neighborhood. And what we found was it was easier to start to talk about those goals once people understood how that individual neighborhood situated in the larger um, in a larger plan. Um, and so we were able to really relate people's vision and desire for what Dorchester could be to that larger, um, larger Boston vision um, and, and begin to build on what was shown in the Resilient Harbor vision and flesh it out and create nuance across the city of Dorchester. And I can't speak too much to this plan. It's not published yet. It's in progress. But I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of exciting aspects here um, that marry a sort of connected vision with the, the concerns and needs of individual sites of adaptation. Um, and, um, you know, I think going back, the other thing is going back to sort of testing these ideas. This was the first of the neighborhood plans in Boston to actually take on and model some of the, the final version of the adaptation and Woods Hole Group, um, Elise who just spoke, did that. So I encourage you when this plan is out to take a look at it. I think you'll find um, some of the shoreline strategies and techniques um, potentially applicable um, in Nantucket. So with that, I wanna just um, 
take a pause and um, open it up for questions, discussions. I definitely wanted to share some ideas. Um, and, you know, as a designer, saw them more as prompts um, for us to be able to, to talk um, and explore what it means to design for resilience. So thank you. Thank you, Pippa. That was really great. Um, are there any questions? I'll give you a, a moment to digest all of that. Let's see. Oh, sorry. My questions, Pippa, would be, how did you get into this field? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I, um, as you mentioned in my introduction, I studied um, environmental science and public policy um, and always had a really strong interest in the the natural environment, but the interface between the built and natural environment and how we could sort of live in and be stewards of our our world. Um, but also kind of always had a ongoing interest in art and design and struggled with how to marry the two um, and had um, the opportunity as an undergraduate to take a class with Richard Foreman, who's a sort of foremost thinker on landscape ecology um, and was really inspired by the work that he did, but also that the class was kind of taught within the design school and really opened my eyes to this opportunity of design um, as an avenue for thinking about these issues. Um, and, um, and it kind of just grew from there. Um, on the resilience standpoint, um, you know, I, I did a lot of different things. I focused um, within my planning work on um, transportation and again, the, the background in ecology that, but in the wake of Sandy, you know, I was in New York after Sandy, um, I was working um, with engineering partners and it was sort of an all hands on deck um, situation amongst a lot of uh, the design practice um, and really have been, you know, we're still trying to build out the, the needs that were identified in the wake of that storm, so. Here's a, okay, we've got two questions. How do you feel about hard structures on the beach to mitigate erosion? Yeah, this is a, this is a challenging, um, a challenging thing. And it really depends also, I think different people feel different, uh, different things are hard structures. Um, I think a lot of people see, there are folks that see the breakwaters as hard structures. They are hard structures, but they're also living structures that are enabled, like an, a, a, enable attracting um, resources and organisms. I think it goes back to, um, to modeling and really understanding what works there. Um, and also what you want the coast to be. Big picture, I think we have hardened way too much of our shoreline. Um, and, 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 you know, it's been proven over hardening, extensive hardening of shorelines um, can exacerbate erosion along the remaining soft shorelines. It can also deprive waters of sediment creating sort of ripple effects that um, that not only sort of create direct downdrift erosion, um, but by starving, but by um, depriving shorelines of sediment allow, like interrupt those natural processes. So we don't, we're not able to naturally replenish the beaches and you kind of result in a lot of um, sand placement. So we need to think really um, hard when we think about hard structures, you know, that said, we have developed parts of our shoreline and we live near the shore and we, you know, people who appreciate the water are often the people who own boats and do boats and you need some of those things for maritime access. So I really, I like to think holistically that it's a real balancing act, um, but more broadly, we need more, we need more soft and a little less hard overall. <laughs> this is my head. Okay, uh, a couple of questions. I think two are somewhat similar. Let's see if I can merge these together. Jen says the breakwater project in the harbors around New York is fascinating. Looking at Nantucket's coastal erosion, could you imagine issues with designing something like this in a non-harbor system? So offshore on an open ocean beach, mm -hmm. would you envision issues with erosion on adjacent beaches 
or other impacts to altering sand movement along the shores? And Timothy asks, do you have observations or recommendations about coastal erosion at uh, Eastern Shore in Nantucket and Gay Head on Martha's Vineyard? So I guess a similar thing of, could you imagine a breakwater project mm -hmm. working in an ocean? Yeah, and there are many examples of, of breakwaters projects in oceans, and it really depends on the specific design. I think the concept of the living breakwaters were developed you know, in reaction to the shoreline, but that careful testing that I said was really um, was really critical to the um, to the process. Um, I'm going to just highlight something about coastal erosion um, and that each site is really each site is really unique. So one thing about this site is the general pattern of longshore transport was from the northeast to the southwest, and you know what exists offshore is a federal navigation channel. So this isn't an area where we're getting a lot of erosion a lot over time, but basically you're eroding the shore here and it's flowing down and you'll see, you know, it's building up here, but it's also going into the navigation channel and then they dredge it. So there was not a huge risk of downdrift erosion. In other areas, there really are, and this wouldn't be the right solution. So you really have, to, it's very site specific. Um, you know, I think, are there places, you know, in, um, in Nantucket and along the coast of um, along the coast of Massachusetts and the Cape, where these type of strategies would work well, and how we could start to enhance the more traditional breakwaters with other um, aspects, yes. But sh but I, it's really important to actually test and see that and and model that. Um, because I think there's a great risk of exacerbating erosion. And we've seen that, right? I think we've seen a lot of places where we've done groins, you know, as you even see here, you see that pattern um, where we've done that to hold the beach and it's kind of create, uh, entered us into that, um, you know, that vicious cycle of needing to replenish the beach, right? I put on a groin, it erodes down, and then I have to keep like moving the sand and disrupting the beach. So thinking, thinking long-term and ways that you, there are strategies that can create a balancing act um, is really important. Great. Uh, Kim asks, specifically looking at the oil project, is there a concern or thoughts about rising ocean acidification as climate change progresses? Yeah, I think that's one of, um, that's one of the ongoing concerns with, um, with oyster restoration and other habitat concerns, but, you know, like sea level rise, it is in some ways a slow process. And by creating these habitats, you know, this area of Staten Island um, used to have a really rich, robust oyster reef that was dynamic. Now it's sort of flat sandy bottom. So the more hardy and robust and diverse the ecosystem is, the greater opportunities uh, we see, at least you know, with our collaborators, the Billion Oyster Project, of it being resilient to ocean acidification. Do we know what's going to happen? No, you know, we don't. And I think that's what I said. You have to embrace uncertainty. But in the near term, and by near term, really like within 50 years, you know, more oyster, the more oysters can help clean the water. They can enhance the habitat by creating this sort of structured habitat for fish. And yes, the rocks alone can do that, but there have been studies up yeah. and down the um, East Coast that indicate that like active live oyster beds create uh, higher quality and attract more diverse fish populations than just the sort of structural part of the reef. So it's not just the reefs, it's something about um, the living organisms themselves. So it's, you know, we're never going to know if something's going to work perfectly. So we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Definitely. Or better. <laughs> it reminds me of the uh, sort of subway map that uh, Ali showed us before, where you do something for a while and maybe you switch over yeah. to something else. Yeah, uh, I think that's one thing is all of these in some ways are adaptive management and alternatives. And we, we need to leave ourselves the flexibility to adapt and change within all of them. Peter asks, all of what you're talking about happens when we've agreed that we're going to fight sea level rise instead of retreat from it. How do you deal with the challenges of convincing municipalities that it's okay for them not 
that it's okay for them to not move inland? I think this is really important um, question to talk about. And in, in many ways, I, I actually think retreat is part of the answer and there's different scales of retreat, right? You know, I look, you know, if we look at the area on the South shore of Staten Island, if you had a, a bungalow that was under the future high water sea level rise, you know, that might be a problem in the future because these, the breakwaters are not intended to like create a wall. I think, you know, if you live in a, a, a dynamic coastal environment and you build a wall to keep sea level rise, high tide flooding and sea level rise out, have you kind of destroyed the environment you're in? So it's a balance, but that doesn't mean that you can't be there for the next 10 years or you can't be there um, and retreat during a storm condition, right? So the breakwaters um, don't keep water out, right? In a hundred year storm, houses there will flood. So the conversations about building elevation that, um, that were discussed earlier in the first two presentations apply. But that photo that I showed of the obliterate, what it means is you'll have a house to come back to. Do you have to change your behavior? Do you have to leave during a storm? Yes. Do you have to make sure when you renovate your house that it's resilient and maybe don't put, you know, your electronics on the first floor and make that a floodable space? Yes. But you can still live there 99% of the time. That's a 1% annual chance storm, one in 100 years. It doesn't mean it's going to be 100 years. But, and I personally, I live fairly close to the waterfront. I would do that. I would make that choice because being close to the water is that important to me. And on a, on a community scale, it's that important to, um, you know, our economy, efficient transportation, client, you know, boats are less energy uh, using than than cars and so we need them for transport, right? There's many reasons that we live and work on the water. So I think striking that balance is really important. Um, so I don't know if I've like, like answered the question directly, but I think talking about that nuance, I think one of the, the issues with retreat at sort of a municipal level and a community level is, is we're so scared to talk about it. Um, because it's really viewed in this binary of either I'm staying there and I'm holding my ground or I'm retreating and I'm running away and I'm gone forever. And it's, it's just not true. That's not, um, you know, that's not how communities work and change. And that's not how we're going to successfully and vibrantly adapt to rising sea levels. So long winded response. But I think, yeah, but I think that's that really, I think it gives people something to think about, you know, the idea that these answers are not, they're not as black and white and it depends on what what is your goal and what's the goal of the community yeah Nan, uh, nina rather says thank you pippa for your wonderful presentation um what are the discussions about addressing cultural and economic equity in the context of designing for nantucket's future yeah and i you know i am less for other projects you've worked on yeah i think it really goes to what the community values are. And what I said about creating a vision, I think we throw around, a, that's why I put the definition of resilience up first, we throw around a lot of terms, um, equity, economic resilience. Like economic resilience means something very different in different communities. I showed Pensacola. Tourism is a really important part of their economy, but they're overly dependent on it. So creating sort of more stable year-round population, creating a downtown that was more vibrant, that they weren't just reliant on the barrier island beaches. That was what it, that, and, and creating that year-round tax base, that was what economic resilience was then. Economic resilience means something else in Nantucket. And so I think facilitating the conversations and cutting through um, jargon to get to really having robust conversations about what this means for you is important. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a COVID health crisis. Um, I think right now also the, the Black Lives Matter movement um, and the protests that we've seen and the sort of reality of um, police violence and that some of these things that we thought were so far from ourselves are actually you know, here in our backyard and affect us, I think has, you know, creating a place where we really need to think critically about that and, and talk to each other um, and ask ourselves what it means 
um, to be equitable as we um, build out resilience. But I, I think it really is about a conversation um, within communities. Yeah. And Rachel says, great presentation. Do you have any thoughts about a hurricane protection barrier, like the one that's in New Bedford as a way to protect against sea level rise? Yeah, hurricane protection barriers are great for storms, um, but they're really problematic. Um, they're for those who might know. Yeah, so I mean, if the, the one in New Bedford is, I think, a, a storm surge gate, sort of like, I mean, the, the Thames barrier in London is, you know, one that we, one that we know um, where when the, the water let, when you have sort of an enclosed bay or estuary that you can um, deploy those gates when the water levels get too high in a storm, uh, keep the water out and when they recede, close. Rotterdam has a massive barrier. It connects, you know, it protects that city to the 10,000 year storm. Um, and many people have tried to replicate that. But one of the questions, one of the things that we have to realize is risk isn't the same everywhere. So in Rotterdam, that um, the elevation change between sort of daily tide and the 10,000 year storm is something like three feet. That same, or the 100 year storm, and then the 10,000, it's like five feet. That same difference in New York City is are like 10 and 12 feet respectively, right? So it's just that is a whole different magnitude in terms of order of experience and and cost. So with barriers, um, there's a couple things that you're worried about. Um, if you're really talking about that infrequent storm and you're closing them infrequently, then they work pretty well because they're closed for a short period of time. So they don't disrupt the normal hydrodynamics of the bay, right? So you still have tidal flushing, your habitats are healthy, Boats can get in and out. Um, it's not, you know, it's costly when you do close them, but it doesn't happen very often. It's less costly than your entire, you know, town or city getting flooded. Now, with rising sea level, if, you know, depending on how high that is and how vulnerable your coastline is with rising sea levels, if you start, you know, suddenly that 100 year storm, that 1% chance every year, half is a 10% storm, happens every 10 years. And then suddenly it's a 1% storm, you're closing it every day. And then you know, if it's what if it is daily tidal flooding, and you're and you're closing those barriers every day, that that is going to start to uh, disrupt maritime traffic. That's going to disrupt the ecosystems of your harbor. That's going to be really, really expensive because they're really expensive um, to maintain and operate. Um, and I think we don't have a great track record with investing in the maintenance and operation of infrastructure. Um, you know, we've looked to the Dutch a lot um, in terms of precedence for climate change adaptation, specifically to coastal flooding. Um, and uh, it's funny, we look a lot at the, the physical examples that come from the Netherlands. But I think what we fail to see is those physical examples are tailored and combined with the entirely different um, political and financial structure around the maintenance of infrastructure. I mean, they've had regional water planning boards for 200 years to, uh, um, and we barely do regional planning. So there's a, I think it, it's the, like, we really need to kind of think about the context. So um, I think that's, our, I think surge barriers and hurricane barriers are a real challenge when we talk about more frequent storms. Um, because of the disruption they cause and the cost of maintenance. Okay, are, are there any other questions? We have time for maybe one more question. I did, I put a link to the flood yeah. barrier page on the Army Corps website and um, Timothy gave a little description there for those who haven't seen it. Yeah, I think the gates, it also like is unique to the um, to the configuration of the shoreline. So like I said, they're costly, but if you have a narrow area to bridge, it's okay. Um, there have been storm surge barriers and the Army Corps is looking at it again for New York City um, recently, um, as well as Boston 
did a storm surge barrier study. And I think, you know, the conclusion from Boston was that it just took so much that the, the time and cost to do that and that, you know, with, it would detract from spending um, investment on localized adaptation measures and that that just wasn't feasible or worth it. So I think it's, you know, there's a, it's really, we have to think about it in a con like a much larger context. There's not sort of a yes or no answer. Yeah. That's a lot of balancing and a lot of exciting projects that you're working on. Yeah. And thanks so much for taking some time with us this morning uh, and filling us in. Yeah. Really appreciate it. So everybody, um, our next session isn't until 1.45. So we'll see you back here then. Thanks again, Pippa. Thank you. I look forward to the rest of the conference.